All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Russ Barabee. I am here from California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I work as part of the Heritage and Wild Trout Program out there, and we're responsible for managing all of the trout species that we have. And so there's kind of that nexus to get me here, because you guys can see in one of my streams, I had a population of bullhead. So I'm going to jump right in. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell you guys about the impacts of invasive species on native fish, but the one statistic I did just want to mention was that it's uh, invasive fish species are actually invasive species in general have been implicated in 68% of all North American fish extinctions. So it's pretty huge when we think about it from, from that perspective. And as I mentioned, that's only North America. Specifically, I wanted to talk about the black bullhead and this species has some life history characteristics which facilitate expansion outside of its native range. Uh, specifically, you have high fecundity, parental care of offspring, opportunistic feeding habits, and then the wide temperature tolerance as well as low DO. Um, I have found these fish in puddles and temps over 35 degrees Celsius and dissolved oxygen less than one milligram per liter. And they're just hanging out the top doing fine. You can see here the native range of black bullhead, and that's in orange. And then we can see also the many areas that it's been uh, found in, reported in on the USGS website. And for us specifically in Southern California, one of the number one reasons that this fish gets introduced is as forage for largemouth bass. And I think that's probably the case in most of the West as well. I put this picture up to show you this is actually taken below our study area and you can see it's just a tiny little puddle and the stream goes completely intermittent and this pool actually does dry every year but then you look closer and this is what you see and you walk up to this pool and these fish are all hanging out at the surface they'd see you they drop down and then within 20 seconds they're all right back at the surface just gilling at that interface to try and extract as much oxygen as they can. We netted we just had to happen to have a dip net and netted over 150 out of that little pool and I'm sure we still didn't get all of them. But this is what got me thinking that um, this system that we're working in drains down into, it turns into a couple of perennial pools during the summer and the fall and it got me thinking that these bullhead would be able to survive in there and then once the system reconnects then they would begin, begin to breed and then the problem would just get worse and worse. <coughs> So the study area is located in northern San Diego County, and uh, it's the west fork of the San Luis Rey River. So it's the headwaters of a system, and tends to be high gradient, um, but the most important thing was that in this system, we have the last known population of wild coastal rainbow trout in San Diego County. And as I mentioned, I'm part of the Heritage and Wild Trout Program. We're responsible through the legislature to actually manage all of California's trout species in order to provide fishing opportunities for the public. And so these fish are not, not only important economically, but aesthetically. I put this picture up here just to show you guys, because uh, uh, before I moved to San Diego, I just assumed that it was like LA and everything was just one big suburb and there were no streams left. And um, you know, as I mentioned, Northern San Diego County, it's actually fairly remote. It takes us two hours to hike into the upper pool. And um, we have trout species. You can see pool one on the left and it's actually flowing in that picture. But then in late summer, early fall, it becomes just an isolated pool and the water kind of oozes out of that bedrock. And then there's another pool right there on the right. We used Promar collapsible minnow traps, and you can see this one here expanded. You know, they got a couple of fikes. They have a little um, little place where you can put the bait with the zipper and a little string attached to them. But most importantly, the reason that we use these is because they're collapsible. We were able to take and fit 12 of them into a backpacking backpack and scrunch them down and we actually found it worked really good to put them in a garbage bag and then you could compact them even more and then we'd still be able to fit our sleeping bag and stove and water filter and all that other um, 
all that other stuff in there and make sure that we could still uh, function basically for three days and two nights. Uh, we used this Temptations bait. Uh, it ended up just being dumb luck that we were uh, went to the 99 cent store and we grabbed some bags of this and never tried another cat food bait. Um, so there could be another one that works, but this one just, just it did really good. So we did a preliminary study when we were down there uh, one night trying to collect uh, genetic samples and we brought some of this bait, threw out some traps, and we ended up catching, I think it was over 30 in about five traps. So that made me realize that we had a problem, but it also made me realize that we had an effective way of removing these fish. So designed a study and... Um, but we set out with the uh, two objectives, and the first one was just reduce the population. We've all dealt with invasive species enough to know that, you know what, this is going to be like mowing the lawn. We're going to have to come back and do this over and over. So um, make the objective simple. Let's just reduce the population. And then on top of that, go back using a depletion estimator and estimate the number that we think were initially there. So back to the study area map I had up earlier. And through initial work that we did with uh, snorkeling, we knew that we had 16 perennial pools that were deep enough, held water, and then there were some sections that would flow well enough and there would be little pockets of water that we could also go in and take care of. So we staged a vehicle at the bottom and then we would get dropped off at the top, hike down to pool 16, and then begin setting traps around 1,500. We'd bait each trap with approximately 15 pieces of cat food, and then we'd throw it into the deepest portion of the stream, um, tie it to a nearby tree, and then let it sit overnight so that we could hopefully catch as many of the nocturnal black bullhead as possible. Um, in the morning, we would hike back upstream and then pull the traps in the order that they were set, enumerate any natives, non-natives, and then release all the natives, euthanize the non-natives on site. And then, uh, as I mentioned, three nights, two days. So we'd go through and we would do pools 16 through 8 the first night and then 7 through 1 the next day. Here's a picture of Miranda throwing a trap out into the deepest part of this pool. This is actually pool 15. Um, but I put this up also to talk about we would tie extra string onto the traps because, as you guys saw in pool 1, uh, the deepest portion was actually all the way back by where the waterfall was. And getting in there wasn't very feasible. So tie extra string on, you could throw them over the cliff, you could throw the traps 20 feet into the, into the middle, it would work out a lot better that way. So <clears throat> we ended up capturing a total of 1,315 black bullhead over a total of four trips. Uh, you can see catch broke down on a per trip basis on this chart and we ended up having some minor technical issues on the first couple of trips with uh, staff not showing up and, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, but once we got going, then you figured everything out. Um, but the interesting thing is you can see that catch decreased by pretty much half on every trip. And I'll just leave it at that. And then CPUE also decreased rapidly from one trip to the next, and you know, we definitely got some tight confidence intervals in the end. I mentioned that we had 16 perennial pools, and there, were, there was water connecting a lot of those. And so you can see here, we set traps in a lot of locations, not just at those perennial pools, anywhere where there was water deep enough to actually cover those trap openings. And you see we got a few zeros, and but what the most interesting thing was, and why I wanted to put this chart up there, was to show that 86% of all of the bullhead that we captured were in those 16 perennial pools. And while that's not surprising, considering that that's the preferred habitat of the bullhead, um, we also think that we got a lot of assistance from a drought that was occurring in California at the time. From 2012 to approximately 2017, California experienced one of the worst droughts, and in this particular year, 2016, it was one of the worst years on record. I think it was the second worst um, for that specific county. <clears throat> um, 
And this picture here shows you guys what some of that connecting habitat looked like, where, you know, like I mentioned, high gradient stream, you can see there's, there's flow there, but really it's not really flow enough to support either trout or bullhead. So a lot of the habitat looked like this and prevented us from putting traps. So, so you had a lot of that area where you saw on the previous map that there was uh, no traps were actually set. Here's a breakdown of catch within each pool. And I also thought this was interesting because you can see about 60% of all of the bullhead captured were in three of the lower pools. And these pools tended to be a lot wider than the rest, but they were also shallower and there was uh, very little riparian vegetation. And so these pools would also be a lot warmer. And, and I think that's the primary reason for that. But the other reason I wanted to put this chart up there was you can see that uh, on trip number four, we had it in purple on this, and we were able to push catch to zero in 11 of the 16 pools on the fourth trip. I mentioned earlier objectives were to reduce the population. And so by capturing 1,315, I think we achieved that one. And then the second objective was to estimate the population. So we used the Leslie method because we, had, we were able to have unequal effort from one trip to the next. And uh, regressing CPU over cumulative catch, we came up with a population estimate of 1,360. And we we're pretty happy to have the total number caught be within 100 of the actual estimate, even though you know, obviously confidence intervals play into that too. So it ended up that we found baited minnow traps set overnight proved to be extremely effective at removing black bullhead from the headwaters of a trout stream. Um, in addition to decreasing the confidence intervals, we also, uh, we also saw that reduced catch and we drove those numbers to zero. But one of the important things I wanted to talk about, which I'm not sure is a huge I guess it could, it could be relevant in Tennessee when we talk about the plenary session, the guys snorkeling. Um, when we did this work, prior to doing this, we snorkeled the whole entire stream to enumerate the trout. And during that snorkel survey, we saw no more than four black bullhead in any of the single pools. But you can see how many we removed from each pool. And so that got me thinking that it could be really important if someone were to use this method and see an invasive species such as black bullhead and then think, oh, okay, we only got a couple, it's not a big deal. And you don't get out there and use something like night snorkeling. Um, that guy mentioned snorkeling at night and I tried it and I did not like it. I don't know if you guys know. <laughs> I froze and, and it was not fun. <laughs> um, but this provides a great way to go ahead and if you're, you know, obviously, I don't know if this would work in a, in a flowing stream in, in Tennessee, but it could be useful to throw out and actually get it, and then you have a non-lethal way of getting some fish in a trap, be able to possibly look at the problem. Um, the other thing I thought was important was that these traps have multiple benefits to them. You know, they're pretty cheap, about 30 bucks a trap, so... I don't think that's very expensive in our um, fisheries world where a fish board can be over $200. Um, you know, and that's not the digital ones. <laughs> um, but then being collapsible, also really great benefit of being able to throw a whole bunch into a pack and then get into some of these remote areas because uh, I tried this once with the aluminum traps and didn't catch a thing. And those were much more, well, much more of a pain to carry. Um, I also think... Another benefit, you're talking no training on these things, you know, with all the stuff that we deal with. And then minimal hazards of setting a trap when you compare that to electrofishing or rope known. So, um, as I mentioned, multiple benefits. And then this is a picture of what I know is the upstream source of black bullhead in this system. Uh, it's a private property, and as you can see, they run cattle on it. Um, we got permission from the landowner to be able to run traps on it in 16, 17, and 18. And in 16, we caught less than 100, I think it was 85. And then in 2017 and 18, we caught about 250 each. We ended up setting almost 30 traps 
in this particular pond. And I think part of the reason that we didn't catch nearly as many as are in there is you can see there's really dense stands of aquatic vegetation all throughout this pond. And for some reason, that seems to limit the ability of the bullhead to get to it. And it's possible that maybe setting 30 traps in a small pond like this is too many, that maybe we should go back and just try it with 10. But unfortunately, I did not get permission in 2019 to, uh, to actually trap this. However, um, the good thing is, and, and I think I neglected to mention this earlier, in follow-up surveys that we did in, uh, we did follow-up surveys running traps in all of the 16 pools as well as the entire area in 26, uh, 2017, 2018, and 2019, and we captured zero black bullhead using the same technique. So even with this pond still having it and with a high flow event in 17 and 19 when this thing overtopped a, a barrier just downstream, we still haven't seen any bullhead back in the lower system. And with that, I'd like to thank collaborators that you guys all know we can't do this work alone. Um, uh, Caltrout provided funding, and then U.S. Forest Service provided actual staff, and then, of course, uh, technicians who went out and actually suffered and hiked with me. And that's it. I'll take any questions. We have a few minutes for questions. Yes. I had a couple of questions. The, um,